Hi, Samson. How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, feeling a lot better. Yeah, how are you? It's good. It's good. Nice. Nice. Actually, my fiance was saying that she, she was craving KBBQ today too, but I think we, we both get back a little bit too late from work to, uh, to eat it. So we might, we might pick, pick up something from H Mart and, and just grill it at home. Oh, uh, we usually get the, uh, um, the the cheaper ones. Honestly, like we get the uh, the thin pork belly. We like that one a lot. We like the brisket, of course. Uh, beef belly, yeah, just the usual. We have um, we have sambal. We have the sambal, the spicy one, and so that's that's already kind of made at home. Um, and then we have we have another like Taiwanese barbecue dipping sauce that we like to use too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we uh, we're gonna cover just just like we did for the other um, other body parts. We have some extra slides to to cover just like the general anatomy of the spine, uh, and then once we start doing problems, we'll switch over to the to the iPad.
Oh, it didn't? Oh, shoot. Oh, I must have uh, forgotten to put it there. Um, that was my bad. Um, I can do it. I can do it after the. Uh, I can do it after the. Um, after my after all my lectures today, so I, I don't finish lecturing until seven o'clock, unfortunately. Um, but then once once I get back to my office, I'll, I'll put the answers for two weeks. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for letting me know. I I, I didn't know that. At, uh, I didn't notice that at all. All right. It's uh, four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. Good e uh, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Small crowd today. <laughs> Literally nobody in the classroom right now, but uh, but the six of you that are here on Zoom. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming. Um, you know, it's I've always imagined that this situation might might happen at least once. You know, uh, while I'm working here, you know, just uh, you know, maybe one or a couple of people just come to the lecture. But, you know, that's no reason to not give my all for for this too. So, uh, so thank you guys for coming, and you know, um, but I imagine you know this time's probably a really busy time for everyone. So um, you know. Hopefully everyone's hanging in there. Hopefully everyone's staying healthy and you know taking care of yourselves. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, the plan for today is we're going to do uh, we're going to start a new set of lecture notes on spinal biomechanics. Okay, and so we finished with the upper extremity, we finished with the lower extremity, um, and now we're going to move on to the last I would say major um, major mechanical part of your body, which is your spine. Okay, um, and so we'll talk about just the we'll start off with some uh, lecture slides just talking about just the general anatomy. General characteristics: What are the muscles and the joints look like in the in the spine? Um, and then we'll move on to um, do some static um, analysis calculations. Okay. All right. Um, homework four is due tonight. Um, is due tonight at 11:59 p.m. Um, someone pointed out before the class that I, I didn't put solutions for problem two B, and so that was uh, that was my bad. And so when I get back up to my office, I will um, look up my solutions for that and then post that on on Canvas, so so you can check your answers. Okay. Um, I posted homework five, and so homework five is the next homework assignment, which is going to be about lower extremity biomechanics and spinal biomechanics, right? And so that's available for you to look at can on Canvas right now, um, and that's going to be due in two weeks, okay? And in terms of structure, it's, it's very similar to homework four in that um, there's going to be a short answer um, portion, there's going to be a question where you do some static analysis, and then the last question, just like, you know, just like the last one, is going to be a research type question. And so you're, I'm going to ask you to look into the literature to answer one of two either research questions. Okay. Um, all right, other announcements I have to make. Um, this week, this week I was really busy just uh, preparing uh, new assignments for all my classes, but next week I think I'll, I'll have some time and I'll be I'll be writing up the, the final project for, for this class, okay? And so I, I want to make sure I get you the final project, you know, by next week so that you can you can start thinking about it. And right now, my plan for the final project is for it to be kind of like a uh, a bigger version of, of the research questions that you've been doing. Okay, because um, the thing with with biomechanics and um, you know and and this class is kind of really unfortunately placed because it's it's you know we're I'm teaching it as as a technical elective and there's really nothing beyond this. And so you know for a lot of you, I know this is kind of your one stop shop for any kind of biomechanics that you have you know in your whole educational career. Whereas in a lot of other places, and, and kind of what I based this class around, this is kind of the first biomechanics class in a series um, through which you kind of learn a lot of applications and a lot of specialized topics. And so, um, and you know, and I feel bad because I, I know a lot of you are really interested in a lot of um, really specialized topics too. So things like prostheses, things like sports biomechanics, um, even things like animal locomotion, right? So how animals um, you know use their limbs to move. A lot of these are really specialized topics that you know we just don't really have time to cover in, in this class, you know, because we kind of have to build. We basically had to build up everything from scratch. You know, we started with just really basic anatomy, bones, muscles, you know, joints, um, and finally we're doing some calculations here. And so for the final project, you know, it's I'm I'm going to have you either pair up, so either with one other, working with one other person or or two other people, um, and I want you to look into one of those really specialized topics, and I want you to prepare a report. Um, very similar to the um, very similar to the homework reports that you've been doing, but you know much longer, of course, and requiring a lot more sources. Um, and I want you to prepare a presentation as well, so that you can present um, present what you found to the class, um, so that everyone can learn about those topics as well. Okay. All right. Question. So, will will I make more detailed classes related to biomechanics? I'm not sure, and so um, you know. Um, a lot, a lot of beyond of what's of what's covered in this class, like very specialized, like human motion. Um, I would say that's that's actually a little bit outside my expertise. And so, 
Um, I don't know if I, I'm really qualified to teach those classes, you know, at least at least not now. You know, I probably have to spend a lot of time studying it. Um, there is another specialized biomechanics class that I that I've made um, called EGME 442, uh, but that strictly um, has to do with blood flow. Okay, um, and so if you're interested in in the, in the biomechanics of blood flow, then you can take that class. But at, as of this time, I, I don't know if it's going to be offered next semester. So I, I requested that be offered. Um, you know, I requested that be offered next semester, but you know, it's uh, um, you know, it's up to the department. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I know a lot of a lot of people are really interested in the biomechanics stuff. That's why I kind of made this class and I made the I made the cardiovascular class too. And so, um, you know, hopefully these classes become kind of a regular staple in, in the uh, um, in the department so that more people can take it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So every group is going to have a different topic, um, and so I don't want um, I don't want two groups doing the same topic, but um, but I'm going to let you guys choose your topics as well. Okay. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna put together a list of topics. And the way I'm going to have it, I'm, the way I'm going to um, do it is I'm going to have, you know, after you guys form your groups, you guys can email me with your preference for the for the topics, and I'll try to make it so that everyone gets at least their top pick, or at least, you know, one of their two top picks, okay? Um, and so, you know, look forward to that uh, probably next week. Okay? So I, I already have I already have kind of a good list of like about nine or 10 topics in my head. Um, I just need to kind of write it down and, and kind of de um, describe it and kind of lay out kind of the, um, all of the, the, um, what you call um, all the requirements for the for the project as well. Okay, so you can look forward to the uh, you can look forward to the the specs and for the topic list um, coming next week. Okay, okay. Um, but just but just to give you a preview, so some of the things I'm thinking of are, are things like prostheses, things like um, rehabilitative uh, rehabilitative motion uh, medicine, um, animal biomechanics, right? Um, and among and among animals, you know, we can have different uh, we can have different groups in there too. So we can do like you know, four four-legged animals. We can have, um, you know, even flight. Um, we can have, you know, swimming fish. You know, there's there's a lot of things you can do in there too. Um, you, we can do um, assistive devices, so um, things like exoskeletons, um, things like wheelchair design. Okay, and so there's there's a lot of um, you know human-centered design, right? And so designing any kind of device that that interfaces with humans. Um, and so that's just to kind of give you just kind of a sneak preview of some of the topics that I have. I have going, but you know, uh, I'll give you the full list, you know, with details and everything uh, for next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, or so, are there are there any other questions before we uh, we get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's go ahead and start talking about the the spine, right? Yeah. Okay. So general characteristics, right? And so um, you know, the spine, um, you know. And so kind of just to kind of place this in context, you know, we, we've moved from the upper extremity, which we said is, um, you know, not, not, not relatively not very strong uh, because your upper extremity doesn't bear any weight, but, but you do have a lot of range of motion and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, fine control over your upper extremity because of, just because of all the, the fine motions that you have to do with your hands. Okay? Uh, from there, we move to the lower extremity where the lower extremity obviously has to do a lot more weight bearing because it's at the bottom of your, of your body. Uh, but even your lower extremity does it still has a decent amount a range a decent range of motion as well um, because it, it's responsible for moving your moving yourself forward right um, and so you know we if you kind of have a lever of like you know range of motion versus strength right so upper extremity had much higher range of motion low strength lower extremity had you know a balance of kind of um, strength and range of motion the spine is kind of on the other end of the spectrum right so the spine you know you you can't really move your spine all that much, um, but it's a really important part of your body for you know bearing weight and keeping balance in your body. Okay, and so and so probably the uh, the three most important characteristics that I want you to know about the spine is that it's um, it's the major load bearing structure. Okay, um, and so it, in fact it's the one that connects your upper extremity to your lower one. Okay, and so all, a lot of the stress is actually placed on your lower back. Okay. Um, and you know the other important part of the of the spine, uh, which we're not going to cover all too much in, in this class, but you know inside your spinal column is your spinal cord, right? And that's the main nerve that kind of connects to all of your body. Okay, uh, and so you probably heard of, of cases where people injured their spine uh, and they hurt their spinal cord, um, you know, and then they they're suddenly paralyzed from like from the waist down, right? And so that spinal cord is something that's really important to protect, and that's kind of what the spine is responsible for. for doing. Um, all right, 
And so a lot of the load bearing that the spine does is done by the lumbar spine, which is the, um, the spine in the, the lower part, okay? And so it's already circled here, but let me go ahead and circle it again, okay? So this area right here is the lumbar spine. Um, and it's gonna be the subject of a lot of what we're gonna talk about today, especially, especially in terms of the calculations that we'll do, okay? Um, and the um, and the muscles that comprise the spine are, are often what's called your core muscles, right? And so those are things like your abdominal muscles, like your back muscles, um, your lateral muscles, like your obliques, right? And so all of those are kind of you know the muscles that are around your your core area um, that are used mostly for for balance, okay? Um, and they do them and, and they actually do enable motion in all three planes. And so you know you can kind of use your spine and go forward and back, you can go left to right. And you can go like all around, right? And if you're if you're more skilled than me, you can even do a hula hoop, right? And so all of that has has to do with your your core your core muscles, right? All right. And so in terms of structure, and and you know we'll go over this on the next slide, but the the spine itself is actually divided into five different sections, right? And so and the way you can kind of um, look at the sections is whenever the whenever the spine changes curvature, um, then then you're moving on to a different section, right? And so if you look at kind of this top area. Let me change to red, actually. And so if you look at this top area, it kind of bends backwards like this, right? And so this right here is your, um, your cervical spine, okay? Then you move on to the second area, and the second area kind of bends, you know, the, the, in, the inside of the curve is towards your front. And so this right here is your thoracic spine, okay? Then you enter the kind of the biggest part of your spine, which again, bends backwards. And so this part right here is your lumbar spine. And then you kind of have your, your two, um, your pelvic bone and your tailbone, which are, which are technically part of your spine too, right? And so you have the sacrum, which is this small guy right here, which again, kind of cur curves towards the front, okay? Uh, and then it's a little bit hard to see here. It's probably better to see in, in, this, in this image right here, but this small little, you know, um, end right here, which is your tailbone, it doesn't really change curvature, but it, it's, uh, you know, it, it kind of starts to do that. This is known as your cossacks, okay? And so those are the five main regions of the spine. But again, you know, what we're going to be focusing on mostly is the lumbar spine. Okay. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, where on the spine is more, are more vulnerable to Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the, the question was, uh, what part of your spine is most vulnerable to injuries? So um, in terms of frequency, the amount of um, the, um, the most frequently injured spine is probably your lumbar spine. Um, and that's for, you know, that's for most people, um, just because of, uh, you know, the lumbar spine is kind of the, bar, the part of the spine that bears the most weight when you're just kind of doing normal activities. Um, and so, you know, when people complain about they have a sore lower back, you know, through either through their posture or through the work that they do, most of the time it's going to be their, their lumbar spine. Um, but with that said, you know, because the lumbar spine bears the most weight, they are the sturdiest parts of the spine. And so you'll see the lumbar spinal vertebra are actually pretty big. Um, and so if you're talking about like traumatic injuries and so like injuries to your head or something like that, then those are going to be injuries to your cervical spine up here. Um, and those can actually be pretty, pretty dangerous too. And so if you have any kind of, you know, impact to your head, you know, probably the, the biggest, you know, area of concern would be how is that affecting your spine right here? And so, um, and so, you know, of course, that's, um, that's kind of why you wear a helmet when you're, when you're going biking. Uh, but also some, some things like if you, like, if you are in a car crash, and you know you've ever been rear-ended before. You know that your kind of your head kind of whips back really quickly. Um, and so when you have a whiplash injury, that's also your cervical spine up here too. And so these, and so your cervical spine is is not injured in kind of normal everyday activities. Um, but if you do have something kind of traumatic happen, then that's usually the area where, where it gets hurt. All right. Uh, any questions on on this so far? Okay. All right, so let's talk about the bones of the spine. And, and from here, you can kind of see the, uh, the different sections of the, of the spine a little bit better, okay? Um, and so the, um, the typical person has 33 vertebrate bones. And so your vertebrae are basically these, you know, each one of these is a separate vertebrae, okay? Um, and 33 is kind of the average number, but, but you know, there, there is some variation among different people. So some people might have maybe one or two less or one or two more, but 33 is, is usually a good, a good average. And the average number of bones in each section are, are divided by the following. Um, and each of these bones are, are given a name um, based on what section they are and what bone they are in that section. Right? And so let's go from the top down. So 
starting from the top, we have seven um, cervical vertebrae, right? And so those are these seven right here, okay? And they're listed or they're labeled um, C1 through C7. And so C1 is gonna be at the very top, okay? And then C7 is gonna be down here, okay? Uh, and so that's the, that's all the cervical vertebrae. Next, we have the 12 thoracic vertebrae. And so that's labeled T1 through, three, through uh, T12. And so that's all of these guys right here, okay? Again, T1 is located is at the top of the thoracic spine and T12 is at the bottom, okay? Then we have your five lumbar vertebrae, which are, you know, these, um, these guys right here. And you can see, and you can see from this kind of more realistic image, how much bigger the lumbar vertebrae are compared to the cervical ones, because the lumbar vertebrae are the ones that are bearing all the weight in your, in your spine, okay? All right, then we have um, the sacral vertebrae, which are um, these, you can kind of see it best in, in, this, in this view right here. Um, and so we, generally these are considered as, as one bone because they're, even though they're, you can see that they're from the ridges right here that they used to be probably separate vertebrae bones, um, but through evolution and, and things like that, they were, they're fused into one, okay? Um, and then we have four uh, Cossack bones at the very, very bottom. It's probably the easiest to see from, from this view. Okay. All right. And so, um, you know, that, that person to person variation I was talking about, that's mostly, um, most of the variation comes in the amount of lumbar vertebrae. Okay. And so, you know, uh, if you have someone that has one or two more or less uh, vertebrae bones, usually it's, it's in the lumbar section. Okay. Um, and kind of, and like I said on the previous slide, the easy way that you can tell if you're just looking at a spine just from the side, um, each of the sections has a different curvature to it. Right? And so for the cervical vertebrae, we curve this way. Okay. For the thoracic vertebrae, we curve this way. For the lumbar vertebrae, we curve this way. For the sacral vertebrae, we curve this way. And then the Cossacks one kind of starts to curve the, the other way, but you, know, you can kind of see it makes this kind of wavy um, S pattern. And that's at least what a healthy spine should, should look like. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the vertebrae bones themselves. Okay. And so the vertebrae are, are very interesting bones, and so um, they don't really have a classification like like long bone or short bone or anything like that because they're kind of um, you know they're kind of very unique in structure. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the, the parts of a vertebrae consist of a body, okay? And so the body, you know, you can see from this image is this one right here, okay? And so the body is uh, basically where, which is where it's gonna be doing uh, most of the load bearing, okay? And so the body is kind of this very thick part of the vertebrae because that's where most of the load is going to happen. So that part needs to be strong, okay? Um, next, we have the hollow ring. And so the hollow ring, you kind of see in this part right here, and so that's basically where the spinal cord will go through, right? Um, and then it also has all of these, what I call appendages. So these appendages are kind of, you know, extra parts of the bone that kind of um, come off of it, okay? All right. Um, and so this is what a typical vertebrae looks like, but the, uh, but the C1 and C2 bones, which are the, the top two cervical vertebrae, they have, a, they have a slightly different shape because they have to connect to the skull, right? And so, your spine, your spinal, your spinal column is going to connect to your skull, and your C1 and C2 have to have special shapes in order to, to do that. Okay. Um, and you know, just like I mentioned before, so as you go down the spinal column, the vertebrae will get larger and larger with size, um, just due to the fact that you know all the lower vertebrae in your lumbar spine have to support all of the weight above it, right? And so that includes not only all of the vertebrae bones above it, but also all the weight from your upper body. Um, and it gets kind of thickest in the lumbar, the lumbar vertebrae, okay? Uh, and in terms of the bony appendages, and so for, you know, all these extra bony parts on the outside, so these, these things help a little bit with the load bearing uh, when, they're, when they just happen to be in contact, uh, but their main purpose is, is actually to restrict the range of motion, okay? And so these, these bony appendages are, are basically designed so that when they make contact, they kind of prevent your back from, um, you know, from, from extending even more, okay? Um, and so, and so, you know, from this image right here, we're, we're looking, we're basically looking at a person's spine from, from the side. And so this right here would be the front. And this right here would be the back, okay? 
right? You can imagine if someone, and you can try this too, so you can kind of, kind of try to lean back in your, in your chair, right? And there's, there's a point where you can't bend back anymore, right? You compare that to your front and you can kind of bend, you can bend forward a lot. And the main thing that kind of prevents you from bending back even further is the fact that on the, on the back side of your vertebrae, you have all of these bony appendages. And as you bend back and back more, then these start to kind of rotate into each other um, and they start to make contact. And so once they start to make contact, then they prevent any more kind of rotation in that, in that area, okay? Um, and so that's really important because, um, you know, this kind of helps keep your, your spine in a good position and it kind of helps with your posture to make sure that you're not leaning, leaning back too much. Um, all right, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, intervertebral discs, okay? And so in between all your vertebrae, you have kind of this, this little cushion called a, a disc, okay? Um, and so if you wanna look at kind of a cross section of the disc, it, it kind of looks like this, okay? Uh, and so these discs are, are are made of fibrous um, cartilage, basically. Okay, and so that's why we call it fibrocartilage, cartilaginous discs. Okay, and their main role is to basically act as cushions. Because right? you can imagine, you know, because your spine is responsible for weight bearing a lot, then your vertebrae they're going to want to compress against each other a lot too. Right? And so, you know, just by standing up or just by you know being a part of Earth's gravity, then your spinal column is almost always going to be in compression. Um, and to kind of prevent you from having these kind of bone on bone contacts, you have these little um, you know, cushion discs in between each of the vertebrae to kind of prevent that from, from happening. Okay. And so mechanically, you, you can almost think of them like, like a spring. And so, um, and so basically when the discs compress or when your um, vertebrae column compress, then it's gonna compress the discs, okay? And so the discs, um, you know, they start out kind of in a, Kind of in line with the uh, with the spine, but as you compress it, you know they kind of bulge out a little bit because they're they're kind of acting like a cushion. Okay? Um, and so they're and so you know they're almost kind of like you can kind of think of them as like shock absorbers for your for your spine. Okay, and so whenever you compress or you have kind of impact forces, then the um, then your discs are there to kind of prevent any any bad things from happening. Actually, okay? um, but because they're because they're made of you know of an elastic material. You know, they're also going to apply a reaction force, which kind of pushes your vertebrae back apart. Okay, and so they're very much like any kind of uh, soft tissue that we've been looking at the body. So the like the muscles and the tendons, um, except they're they're mostly going to be in compression rather than tension. Okay. All right, and so injury to these discs is is fairly common, especially for um, for older people. Although it can happen to young people quite a bit too. Okay, and so what can happen is that if the discs are compressed so much. Right. And so let's say that, you know, you had something happen where, um, you know, you put a huge compressive force on the on the vertebrae. Right. Then what can happen is that the the, uh, the disc can kind of bulge out to one side. OK. Right. And so you have kind of the, the disc kind of um, bulging out um, or even worse, you know, and I drew it on the wrong side. You know, the disc might actually bulge out on the other side. OK. And remember, on the other side right here, you have your spinal, your spinal cord. Right. And so if your disc actually bulges out and actually starts to pinch, uh, pinch onto, the, uh, onto the spinal cord, this could be really, really painful, okay? And when this happens, this is known, um, better known as a hernia, okay? okay? As you might've heard the term herniated discs or slipped discs, right? And so those, those all involve some kind of injury to the, to the disc, okay? Um, and so one, one version of a hernia is, is the disc is the disc is basically squished so much that it bulges out, um, or it can even slip out of the socket, right? And so that's what's called a slip disc. Okay? And so we'll talk about hernias a bit more later because they're um, you know they can be very very painful, um, and they can be pretty common as well. Okay. Um, and so you know these um, this is usually caused by either severe forces and stresses on the spinal column, um, or it can be um, you know, due to a lot of fatigue as well, right? And so just like, just like any other elastic material, um, you know, these discs are subject to fatigue. And so if you kind of put them under a lot of stress, you know, a lot, then it's just gonna take one little thing to kind of make, to kind of make it bulge out and cause a lot of pain, okay? All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Yeah. Um, is there a way to like reinforce it to make that stronger or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
No, it's a good question. So the question is, is there a way to kind of reinforce the disk to make it stronger? Um, most of most, the, be, the best way to take care of your disk is to make, is to kind of mimic the amount of forces that you, um, that you put on there. And so a lot of it is just, you know, having good posture. And so making sure that you kind of balance the, the forces on your, on your spine, uh, making sure that when you, when you do certain tasks, you don't put a lot of stress on your back. Um, and so when we do, when we get to the calculations, actually, we'll be talking about um, a lifting task. And so, you know, maybe um, you, you guys probably, you guys are probably all taking safety training for around here. So whenever you're lifting something heavy from the ground, you know, everyone always tells you to lift with your legs, right? to lift with your back. And so, and we'll, and so we'll, we'll actually compute, you know, how, what, what a difference that makes on, on the stress that it puts on your spine. Yeah. And so in terms of like devices, in terms of diet, um, I don't know if there's anything, um, anything significant that strengthens that. Uh, although, you know, a good calcium diet, of course, is, is good for your, your bone strength. Um, I think that, I think the danger is, um, the danger of putting any kind of device on the spine is that, you know, the spinal cord is right there. And so I think any kind of, any, any kind of thing you want to implant in there is going to be very risky because you're going to risk being the spinal cord. Yeah. Um, but actually in, in homework five, um, um, one of the, one of the research questions I'm having you look into is, um, is to do an analysis on an exoskeleton and to do, and to do a little bit of research into that. And so that's one kind of external device that you can, that you can have to kind of, you know, Make sure that your your spine is kind of in the right alignment. So, yeah, so that, that one should be really interesting, actually. So, um, I actually, I anticipate most people to pick that one. Um, all right. Any other questions on on this? Okay. All right. And so let's uh, let's spend a bit of time talking about spinal curvature, okay? Right? Because the curvature of the spine is actually you know a really important um, physiological or anatomical. Um, you know, um, assessment for how healthy your spine is. Okay. And so your spine should have curvature to it, right? And so there, there should be some curvature, you know, for a healthy spine. Okay. Um, and the direction of the curvature, you know, like we said, depends on the, um, on the section of the spine that you're in. Okay. And so for the thoracic spine and the, um, and the sacral spine, right? These have what's called an anterior curvature. And so in other words, they curve towards the front. Whereas the um, lumbar spine and the cervical spine, these have a posterior curvature, so they should curve from the back, okay? Right. Um, and these curvatures actually develop as, as a person, um, you know, and, and they actually change as a person grows, actually. So um, anterior curvatures, you know, both of these, both the thoracic spine and the sacral curvatures are present at birth. Um, but, you know, as, as, as after a baby's born and after kind of adjust to Earth's gravity, then that kind of puts the cervical spine and the lumbar spine in posterior um, in posterior curvature as well, right? And so these are definitely things that um, that develop with time, especially as the person grows. Okay. All right. And so uh, we have a few terms here that we can um, that we can use to to, um, um, to describe curvature. Okay. And so the first one is lordosis, right? And so lordosis is an exaggeration of the lumbar curvature, right? and so you can kind of see that from the image right here. Okay. And so you can kind of you can kind of put your spine in lordosis by kind of sticking your tummy outwards and then kind of enhancing that that curvature of, of your lumbar spine. Okay, and so you can see that's kind of what this person is doing. And so he's kind of sticking his his belly button that way, and his spine his lumbar spine is is exaggerating that curvature. Okay? Uh, but some people have a path what's called a pathological lordosis where their lumbar spine has too much curvature even without them sticking out their their, their tummy right. Um, and this, this is usually attributed to weakened abdominal muscles, okay? Um, and so if the abdominal muscles are not, you know, strong enough to, to, do, to do any weight bearing, then usually what happens is the spinal, um, the spine, the back, um, the back muscles there have to compensate. And because of that, then it kind of puts this unnatural, um, um, unnatural curvature in your back, okay, called lordosis. Yeah. All right, so the, um, a, another, another unnatural type of, of curvature is called kyphosis, right? And so this is an exaggeration of the thoracic, um, thoracic curvature, okay? And so you kind of, you know, kind of, if you kind of bring your shoulders forward, you kind of do like that, okay? Um, and so if you're familiar with Disney movies, then this is, um, this is what's known as, as hunchback, right? And so if you have a hunchback, then you have a really exaggerated thoracic curvature, right? Um, and so this is, can usually result from um, what's called a congenital anomaly. 
right? And so congenital, whenever you see the word congenital, what that means is that this person was basically born with it, okay? And so, you know, for some people, it's just genetic. They have, they have a much more exaggerated thoracic curvature um, or osteoporosis can also cause this as well, okay? And so if the bones are weak, then basically then the, the body has to kind of adjust its, its geometry to make sure that the stress on your spine is, is less, okay? All right, and the last, uh, the last curvature term that we'll talk about is scoliosis, right? Um, and so uh, I know, at least I know when, when, I, was, uh, when I was in grade school, I, um, you know, every kid was checked for scoliosis and scoliosis is a curvature of the spine in the left and right directions, right? And so um, this should not happen. And so you shouldn't have any curvature in, in the left and right directions. And so if you do, you have scoliosis um, and you, know, you should um, you know, definitely get that, that checked out, okay? Um, and scoliosis can either happen in a C-shape or in an S-shape, right? And so in a C-shape, I think you'll, you're, you're gonna have one kind of exaggerated curve going left to right uh, like that. Um, in the S-shape, you kind of have two exaggerated curves kind of more, more so like that. Uh, but either way, you know, whenever you have scoliosis, that puts a lot of kind of unnatural stresses on your, on your lower back. Um, and which can lead to a lot of other health problems, you know, later on in life. And so um, that's why they check, they, um, you know, doctors check, um, check for scoliosis for, for young kids um, because, you know, for, for young kids, you know, they, they, you know, they're still growing. And so there's ways to fix this or there's ways to kind of adjust their, um, their life habits to kind of limit either, you know, either cure this or limit the negative effects from scoliosis. Okay. All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about some of the muscles that we're, uh, that we're gonna be working with. And there, there's kind of two main ones that we're gonna be focusing on, at least in our analysis, or I should say there's, there's one main one, um, and that's the spinal erectors, okay? Um, but, but like I said before, you know, any muscles that has to do with kind of the core area in your body, uh, we, we, we consider those as muscles belonging to the spine, because a lot of them insert onto the, onto the pelvis and onto different parts of the spine, okay? All right, so let's first, uh, let's talk about the abs, actually. And so your abdominal flexors, so those are on the front of your body. Um, and so for people with really defined abs, you know, those are the people with the six pack, right? And so this person in particular has an eight pack. And so we have a, a really ripped uh, skeleton, I guess, right? And your abdominals are responsible for spinal and hip flexion. So anything that kind of brings your, your, your head you know, forward, um, that's worked out by your abdominals, right? So that's why when you do sit-ups or when you do leg raises, uh, all of those are kind of hip flexion or spinal flexion. And so that works out your abdominal muscles. Okay? Um, you also have your oblique muscles. And so I, I, don't, I don't have them here, but your obliques are basically your muscles kind of on the side of your body. Okay. okay. Um, and so though your oblique muscles are responsible for, you know, lateral and medial movement of your, of your upper torso, core torso, as well as rotation. Okay. And so those are kind of the muscles on the side, on the sides of your, on, on the sides of your body. But the most crucial muscle that we'll be talking about, um, and the one that's primarily responsible for your, for your sense of balance are your spinal erectors, um, or in other words, um, uh, or sometimes I'll call them your, your back extensors, okay? And so those are the muscles kind of immediately above your, 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 your buttocks, right? And so those are responsible for kind of straightening out your, straightening out your back. Okay? So those are all these muscles right here, okay? All right. And so in terms of balance and, and making sure that you're, you're staying upright and you don't kind of topple over each other, these are the main muscles that are, that are going to be active, okay? Um, and most of the time, they're, they're flexing without you really even realizing it, too. So if you're just kind of standing still, um, you know, your spinal erectors are actually working to um, make sure that you stay balanced, right? And so me standing here at the podium, you know, your spinal erector, my, I can, you know, I know my spinal erectors are, are working, even though I, I, don't, I don't think about it. I don't, I don't feel it. Uh, but those muscles are, 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 are flexible, okay? And so what we'll see in, in our analysis is that, you know, these, um, what these spinal rector muscles are doing, um, this is going to be the main determinant of how much stress your, your spine is going to be on, okay? Because the thing with these spinal rector muscles is that their attachment angles are, are usually fairly small. And so if we kind of draw kind of a, you know, let's say we have a lumbar spine right here, okay? The spinal erector is going to be acting, you know, somewhat, and that's not even, that's not even a good drawing, right? And so let's say this is a lumbar um, spine, you know, and the spinal erector might be acting in this direction, right? 
And so you can see it, 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 it kind of hugs the vertebrae really closely, right? And so this angle right here is, is gonna be really small. And so basically the more work, the more work the spinal rector has to do, the more it's gonna compress your, your, your spines together, okay? And so you can see as FM goes up, then this is gonna push this vertebrae back into this one. Okay, and, then, and so that's gonna cause a lot of stress in this region in between here, okay? And so a lot of the, a lot of the work that, that's done to kind of limit, you know, limit damage to your back is to basically you know, try to reduce the amount of work your spinal erectors are doing, right? And so things like having good posture, making sure that you're, you're using good technique whenever you're lifting something, all of that has to do with trying to limit the amount of, of, of work your spinal erectors are doing, okay? Because the less work that these guys are doing, the better shape your back is going to be in, in, in general. All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. <clears throat> okay, and so uh, with that, um, you know, I think the next parts of the slides are common injuries, but I'm going to go ahead and save that for um, after we do the calculation. So let me go ahead and switch to my iPad. Stop sharing here. All right, and so let's, uh, let's start doing some um, calculations with spinal biomechanics. All right. <clears throat> and so, you know, just like we just finished talking about, you know, the spine is an incredibly important part of your, um, uh, of your, of your body, okay? Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, um, one of the parts of your body that's that's subject to probably the most significant forces um, in the body. Okay. okay. And so the first thing that the first thing that we're going to analyze is the action of, of picking up uh, picking up a heavy load from the ground. Okay. And so most uh, most safety trainings, uh, you know, uh, and and just general um, general you know uh, wellness um, information will always tell you to lift with your legs, right? Okay. And so let's say that we have a box that's on the ground like this. And so the correct way that people say to, uh, uh, to lift um, a box like this is to basically bend down. And so kind of put your, put your butt down and, um, towards the ground as much as possible, okay? Bend your knees, okay? And let's say that your other foot is, your other leg is kind of like this, okay? And kind of lift, and kind of lift that way, right? And so do most of the lifting with your, with your legs. Okay? And if you do this, you know, you're gonna be a happy person and your, your back is gonna be fine. So this right here is good. What you don't want to do is let's say that you know you have a heavy load right here, so it's a box of a, a box of stuff, and so you don't want to do this. And so you don't want to bend your back down and try to pick up the box like that. Right? And so this person is sad because his back is gonna he's gonna throw his back out. Right? Because the main the main um, you know, the main muscle that's that's uh, you know if you're if you're lifting with your back like this, the main muscle that's going to be doing this action is your spinal erectors, right? And so it's going to be this muscle right here. Okay. And so if you kind of imagine your entire upper body is kind of a, a lever, right? And it's it's lifting this kind of big heavy load on the on the bottom right here. Okay. Then in order to rotate your upper body, 
you know, the only muscle that can actually do that is your, is your, you know, your back extensors or your spinal erectors down there. Okay. Um, and this is really bad, right? Because, you know, what we'll see, you know, and, and, we'll, and we'll run the calculations for this. So the more, the more force that this FM is, is doing, then it's going to be pinching your vertebrae down here, you know, a lot, a lot. Okay. Um, and that's going to lead to a lot of injuries in your spine. So even, you know, even dramatically things like a herniated disc, um, or even, you know, fractures or things like that. You see a lot of people doing deadlifts. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, you know, I, yeah. And so deadlifts are actually, you know, um, I know deadlifts are kind of, a, um, you know, an exercise where you kind of do this action too. And so, you know, you want, you really want to make sure that you have good posture for, for those things, okay? And we'll, and we'll talk later too that, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, just because of the, maybe the exercise that you're doing. And so maybe you're doing a deadlift. Or maybe just because of you know just because you're physically constrained where you can't actually bend down and pick up a pick up a weight, you're you're kind of forced to be doing this action. And so, but even when you're even when you're doing um, lift you're doing a lifting task, you know where you're kind of bending over. There's things that you can do with your back to kind of make sure that you, you don't hurt yourself. And so, you know, for for people that are doing deadlifts, you know, I, I think you know everyone everyone there kind of understands what you're what you're supposed to do. Uh, but we'll we'll talk about that when we when we get there. But you know, so this right here is generally bad because you're gonna you're gonna throw out your back like this. All right, and so um, let's do a static analysis of both of these situations, and let's quantify uh, let's quantify two things, right? And so first thing we can quantify is we can quantify first just the amount of muscle force that uh, that's needed to perform the task. Right. And so that's that's always kind of the first thing that we um, the first thing that we can um, that we can quantify. Okay. And then the second thing that we can quantify is, um, you know, the amount of, um, of reaction forces at the joint. And for this, and for the spinal biomechanics, this joint reaction force is going to be a lot more important because that's going to tell us how much force are, is going to be placed on the vertebrae and on the discs. Okay. Okay. Um, Right. And so, you know, the more reaction forces at the, you know, at, at your lumbar spine, the more risk you, the, more, the greater risk you are at, uh, at injury. Okay. All right. Any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, uh, and jump into, jump into an example. All right. So let's, uh, let's do, Let's do the bad situation first. And so let's do um, a situation where someone's lifting something with their with their back. Okay. okay. And so usually um, when uh, when someone um, does this, and we're and we're going to focus our analysis on just the on just the spine and the lower body. Okay. Then they're usually kind of hunched over like this. Okay. And so this is kind of their their back. And so let's say this is the back of their knee, this is their foot. Okay. okay. It's probably the best drawing I'm ever going to make in this, in this class. All right. And so, um, you know, in this uh, uh, in this um, arrangement here, you know, let's say that we have our spinal erector muscles right here, okay, our back extensors, and then our lumbar spine is located right right here, okay. It's okay. <laughs> <So> the cringe. <laughs> And so the distance here, 
um, and let's just keep it simple. Um, this distance here, which is the perpendicular distance, we'll call this distance A, okay? And then the, um, the angle at which the um, muscle force is acting, we're gonna measure it relative to the vertical line. Okay. And so let's say that that angle is theta. We also have the um, a normal force acting at the foot, right? And so since we're not modeling the, the upper body here, you know, we have to model kind of the weight of the object and the weight of the upper body kind of from this normal force, okay? And so right here, you know, we're gonna have a force which is gonna weight, be the weight of the upper body. And so we'll call that W top as well as WL, okay? And so that's the combined weight of your upper body and the, um, you know, and the whatever, whatever load that you're working on, okay? And then we also have the, um, the weight of the, uh, of the lower body, okay? And so let's assume that the weight of the lower body is being applied right here. Okay. So this is the weight of your legs, okay? And let's say that this is acting with a distance B, okay? I mean, I didn't write this in, but let's say that the, uh, um, the red force, this is acting with a distance C, okay. okay? And so A, B, and C here are, are gonna be strictly just the, um, you know, the moment arms for each of those forces, right? Um, and so for this one, you know, I'm, I'm gonna limit the amount of trigonometry that we're gonna do. Um, just because I want to, I want to kind of get to the results as, as soon as possible. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. We have our joint reaction forces. We can't forget that. And so let's say that we have a joint reaction force in JY in this direction, and a joint reaction force JX in the horizontal direction. Okay. And let's go ahead and put in some um, put in some um, values for these parameters. Okay. So let's start with A. So let's say that A is equal to 0 0.02H. Okay. B is equal to 0 0.08H. Okay. C is equal to C is equal to 0 0.12H. Okay. Um, so here H, H is the H is the height of the person. Okay. Okay. The weight of the leg, let's say that this is going to be 0 0.4 W. Okay. The weight of the top of the person, the weight of the upper body, we'll call this just straight W. Okay. And the load, let's say that the load has a value of um, 0 0.3 W. And so here, w, w is a is a placeholder variable, um, and that represents the weight of the of the upper body. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, for this uh, from this analysis, we're going to get kind of a, a relative result. Okay. Um, and but but that means you can kind of scale it for however much you know each person weighs. And let's say that the angle, the one angle that we have here, that the the muscle force acts with respect to the vertical. Let's say that that's forty five. Uh, 45 degrees. All right. And so now that we've um, kind of set up the geometry and we set up all of the forces, um, let's let's compute uh, let's compute the muscle force and the joint reaction forces. Okay. All right. Okay. And so, first thing. Um, oh, any any questions on the on the setup for the problem before we um, before we go to solve it? Okay. 
All right, so first thing we're gonna do is um, we're gonna sum the moments around the, uh, around, uh, around the spine, okay? And so we're gonna use that to solve for the muscle force. And so same, basically same thing as we've, we've always done. All right, so the sum of the moments around the joint. Um, here, since, since all the distances that we've been given here are, you know, are, are the moment arms already. And so let's just uh, go ahead and multiply over. And so first thing we're gonna have, um, is F is the FM, okay, FMA. Okay. And if you look at the direction that FM is, is going to rotate around the joint, you can see that it's going to place a clockwise moment, right? And so since it's clockwise, that's why we put a negative in front of, in front of that, okay? Next, we have the um, weight of the, of the leg, okay? And so the weight of the leg is also going to place a clockwise force, right? Because it's uh, it's going down this way, and so it's going to be rotating around that way too. Okay, so that's why we put a negative there. Whereas the um, the weight of the uh, upper body and the weight of the load, this is going to be a counterclockwise moment. Okay, so we have W top plus WL times C. Okay. And all of this is equal to, all of it's equal to zero, okay? All right. And so everything here is, is given to us. The only thing that's not is the, is the muscle force, okay? And so we can go ahead and just solve this equation for, uh, for FM. All right. Uh, any questions on, on this before I, I turn the page? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for FM. Uh, question, so FM doesn't have cosine or sine? No, it doesn't, because the, the A that's here is the, is the perpendicular distance. Okay. And so if we look at kind of the, the distance A right here, you know, and we kind of extend this FM this way, this A is exactly the shortest distance between the F vector and the, and the joint. And so we don't need any, we don't need any sine or cosine. Okay, and so if we solve for M, FM, we get FM is equal to, we have W top plus WL times C minus W leg times B all divided by A, okay? And so if we plug in, uh, we plug in all the variables for this. And so we plug in for each of the weights uh, and we plug in for A, B, and C. What we get is FM is equal to 6.2 times W. Okay. All right, and so what this tells us is that under, under this configuration, then the um, back extensor muscles has to exert a force that's 6.2 times the torso weight. And so once again, you know, we have this, um, you know, effect of a, uh, of like a, a force amplification from the muscles, right? And so, you know, this is not unique to the spine. And so we saw this in the upper extremity and the lower extremity too, where the muscles have to exert a lot greater force than any of its external forces, just because they, they, they act so close to the joints. Right? Good question. Uh, was it negative or positive for W leg in our moment equation? It was it was negative on on this side, but then since we moved FMA to the to the other side of the equation, then the negative for W leg stayed stayed the same. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I kind I, I kind of skipped a couple of steps for, for that. Okay, and so uh, and so to kind of put this in perspective, you know, let's say that we have a uh, you know let's uh, let's say that we have me, and so I, I weigh uh, 155 pounds. And so my torso um, is going to weigh approximately 110 pounds.
Okay. And so, um, you know, uh, what this means is that, you know, if, if my torso weighs 110 pounds, then the load that I'm carrying in this case is about 30% of this, okay? And so WL in this case is going to be about, you know, maybe 33 pounds, okay? okay so not, so, you know, a decent amount, but not, but not that heavy, okay? Um, and so one, and so when I kind of, when I kind of ran the numbers through this and, and I kind of modified the number, kind of make this, um, make this work out. Uh, but one thing I'm doing on a, on a regular basis is carrying uh, big ass bags of cat litter up to my apartment, right? Um, so my cat pees a lot because she's diabetic. And so I'm always having to you know, buy more cat litter and, and replace it in our, in our big litter box. And so, you know, almost every other week I have to buy a 30 pound bag of, of cat litter and carry it up to my apartment. And so, you know, I've modified the numbers on this to kind of make it seem like it's, it's for me, right? And so if it's, if, if, you know, if this, if this was kind of the, the result of, you know, of me and I and I I lifted that bag of cat litter with just my back, then I'm putting almost almost 700 pounds of force on my on my poor lumbar spine. Okay. Or I should say, my I'm putting 700 pounds of force on my uh, on my spinal erector muscles or on my back extensors. Okay. Uh, but what we'll see is that you know it, it's basically it's basically going to be that amount on my uh, on my lumbar spine as well. Okay. And so that's a lot, right? And so you know you we and you know in you know you can kind of imagine how big your vertebrae muscles are. So if you kind of go to your back and kind of you know use your fingers to kind of you know measure out, that's a lot of force they're putting on kind of a tiny bone like that. Okay. All right. And so let's uh, let's go ahead and complete this analysis by computing the joint reaction forces. Okay. And so, um, you know, this one's fairly straightforward just because, you know, we, um, all of our forces are either vertical um, except for the muscle force, okay? And so if we sum the forces in the X direction, okay, then we have JX okay, plus FM sine theta is equal to zero, okay? Remember the theta that we have, uh, the way I define theta in this problem is with, is with respect to the vertical. And so to get the horizontal component of FM, then we take sine of theta, okay? And so if we solve for JX here, then we get JX is equal to 4 point, or negative 4.38 W. Okay. We sum up all the forces in the Y direction. Okay. Now we get JY. JY plus FM cosine theta minus W leg plus um, W top plus WL. Okay. That's equal to zero. And we solve for JY and we get JY is equal to negative 5.28 W. Okay. Right, and so each of the components of the joint reactions are, are also going to be you know fairly strong, right? And so if we compute the uh, uh, if we compute the magnitude of this, right? And so if we compute the uh, um, the magnitude of this force, you'll see that it's even higher than each of these each of these components. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this so far? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and compute the magnitude. And let's see how much uh, how much strain my poor back is going to be going under carrying that thirty pound bag of cat litter. Right? And so, if we take the magnitude of the joint reaction force, okay, which is going to be j x square root j x squared plus j y squared, okay, it's going to be equal to six point eight six w. Okay. Right. And so, if w here is equal to about one hundred ten pounds. Then this is going to be, you know, um, basically seven, almost seven hundred pounds. Okay. And so that's that's a lot of that's a lot of force for your, your poor little lumbar vertebrae to sustain. Okay.
Yeah, 700, 700 pounds is, is, is going to be a lot. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and, then, and this is only just from lifting a 30 pound, a 30 pound weight. Right. And so it's not even it's not even that much. And so, you know, you can imagine for people that are that do deadlifts, right, or, or people that are lifting even more than that, you know, if they use poor technique, then, you know, they're putting their back under, under tons and tons of strain. Right? I mean, but I mean, granted, you know, your bone, your bones and your and your discs are they are they are fairly strong. And so, you know, these these seem like a, a lot of um, a lot of weight for, you know, um, for something like that. But, you know, those those parts of your body are strong. But you don't want to, you know, you obviously don't want to be doing this on a, on a regular basis. Okay, and so let's let's um, remember. And so this is with that technique, right? And so this is kind of doing all the lifting with your back. And so let's compare this um, situation, um, and let's do the same thing, but with a with better technique. Okay, so we have a good lifting technique. And so, um, you know, the, the proper way to kind of lift a, a load like this is to kind of bend down with your knees and kind of lift with your, your legs as much as possible, okay? And what we'll see is that, you know, more so than, you know, more so than having your legs, you know, it seems like when you're doing this, you're kind of offloading a lot of that load to your legs. Um, but actually the, the most significant change that, that, uh, that this is going to do is that it kind of alters the, um, the geometry on how your, your back extensor muscles are, are working. And so that's that's going to be the main thing that kind of helps helps the most. And so let's say that we have a person that's crouching down. Okay. So now the we have a squatting Grinch, I guess. Okay. And so let's say that uh, here we have our lumbar spine. So we'll just call it LS. Put LS on this side. Because we're going to have a lot of other things going on. Okay. All right. And then just like before, we're going to have a muscle force. Okay. But now it's going to be acting a little bit more vertical. Okay. okay. And then this distance again is going to be A. Uh, but A is going to be a little bit different this time because because we're kind of straightening our back. And what we'll see is that it'll it'll actually increase the increase the distance between your back extensors and your and your lumbar spine, which is which is going to be probably the most significant change. Okay. And just like before, we're going to have we're going to find the angle with respect to um, with respect to the vertical. Okay. We have the weight of our legs, which is going to be acting right here. Okay. And then this distance right here, we'll call this B, okay? And then just like last time, we're gonna have a normal force from the ground right here. And so this is gonna be the combined weight of the upper part of your body plus the weight of the load, okay? And this is gonna act at a distance C, okay? All right, and so let's go ahead and put in some some numbers on this, and you'll see that you'll see that the parameters, at least the distances here, are going to change um, a bit. Okay. All right, so let's start with A. So A here is going to be zero point zero three h. Okay. B is going to be zero point one h. And C, C here is going to be we'll assume it to be the same, and C is going to be zero point one two h. Okay. And so the big difference here, you know, by, by bending your legs like this, you're, you're increasing A. And so this one went up and you're also bringing your legs a little bit further away from your body as well. And so you're gonna have your weight, the weight of your legs a little bit farther away, okay? Um, and if you kind of notice from, from the last, uh, from the result of the last example, the weight of your legs are actually helping you out um, a little bit, right? And so if we looked at the numerator on the, um, on your, on the expression for the muscle force, you know, the weight of your legs was actually a negative sign. And so, you know, the further away your legs are um, from, the, from your spine, um, you know, the less work your, your, your muscle has to do, okay? All right, and the, all the weights are gonna stay the same. And so let's say that W leg 
is going to be 0 0.4 W, W top is equal to W, WL is still going to be 0 0.3 W, okay? And then by, by crouching down and straightening our back, we've lowered the angle theta, okay? And so now theta is going to be 20 degrees. Right. Any questions on the uh, any questions on the setup? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and and just do the same approach that we did last time and solve for the muscle force and the joint reaction forces. So let's first sum all the moments. Around the joint. Okay. And so we're gonna end up with the same expression we did last time. And so we have minus FMA minus W leg B plus W top plus WL C, okay? And all this is equal to zero. We solve for FM. So FM in this case is gonna be W top plus WL times C minus W leg times B all divided by A. Okay. And so we plug in all the, the numbers for this, the updated, uh, the updated parameters. Well, remember the, the main things that only changed in this one was the values for A and B, okay? And so if we plug those in, what we get is a muscle force of three point eight seven W. Okay. And so we still end up with you know a fairly a fairly you know a high magnitude here, uh, but it's a lot less than before, right? Because from before, what we got for this was six point two W, right? And so this is about a, a reduction of about maybe 40, 45 percent, okay? Um, and so, you know, just by changing your posture, you, you almost, you almost cut the amount of muscle force in half. Right? So that's, that's really significant. All right. And so, um, you know, let's also compute the joint reaction forces. And so if we sum all the forces in the X direction, then we get JX plus FM sine theta equal to zero. Okay. We solve for JX. JX is equal to minus 1.32 W. At sum of all the forces in the y direction, we have JY plus uh, FM cosine theta minus W leg plus W top plus WL is equal to zero. Okay. We solve for JY and JY here is equal to minus four point Five, we can again solve for the uh, for the resultant. Right? Okay, and so the resultant is equal to square root of j x squared plus j y squared. Okay. And so we compute this, we get 4.73 W. <clears throat> right. 
and so you can see here that you know we we still have a pretty significant you know um, stress being applied on the on the lumbar vertebrae, right? And so that's that's kind of that's kind of unavoidable. Um, but you know it is a lot less here. Right? And so remember, if, if W here is about you know let's say 110 pounds, then we've reduced the load on our um, on our back uh, by about you know a little bit over 200 pounds, right? A little bit over 220 pounds. Okay. Um, and that and that's a bit and that's you know a pretty big difference. Okay? And so you know it might still seem like you're you're putting a lot of load on your back, but you know any reduction that you you get on there is 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 really key. Any uh, any questions on on this? Okay. And so you can see, you know, with the uh, you know from this analysis, even though this was you know fairly simplified analysis, that you know proper technique in in, in doing these um, and doing these things can really make a big difference in in how much strain you're putting your body through. Okay. All right. And so let's let's kind of uh, let's kind of break down that that last couple examples and see what really changed. And so the primary difference, um, the primary differences that we saw between the first technique and the second one was in the fact that, um, you know, when you bend down, you increase the, you increase the moment arms for, you know, the key, um, the key, um, the key muscles. Okay. And so because we've, we've increased these moment arms, then the muscle force doesn't have to work as hard in order to counterbalance all of those, all of those moments. Okay. Another, another natural benefit of, of lifting with your legs um, that, we, that we, didn't, we actually didn't account for here is the fact that you know, when you're bending down to pick up something um, with your, you know, by, by squatting, you kind of naturally kind of bring the load closer to your body. Because if we compare the the two um, the two situations, right? And so let's say that we have the case where someone's lifting with their back, right? You know, just kind of the natural the natural thing, just because our, our torso has a certain length, is to kind of you know, is to kind of in, or is to kind of engage the engage the load um, from a distance like this, right? And so here you can see that we have a pretty large distance here. And so when we, you know, consider the weight of the object like, like that, okay, then in order to counteract this, then the muscles have to supply a much bigger moment, right? Versus if you bend down, pick something up, right? Okay. Again, just by kind of the natural geometry of your body, you know, you, you have to get, you have to get a lot closer to the, to the load before you can lift it. Okay. And so this distance right here is going to be smaller. And so that's going to, that's going to make it so that the, the moment that your muscle is exerting is naturally a lot less too. Okay. Okay. And so M2 is less than M1. Okay, and so that's going to be that's going to be a good thing for your muscle because it's uh, um, you know less uh, less work that they have to do. All right, quick question: By bending, is it possible that we're exerting more force than patella, leading to injuries there after passing a, a yield point? Um, it's possible. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, but 
Um, but I think you know because most of the most of the most of the load is is going to be placed on your on your lower back, um, and really you know for your, your legs you know they're, they're they're not really doing all that much. They're kind of just transferring the load, and so your patella is not actually going to be straining all all too much in, in this configuration. Okay. All right. Uh, any final questions on on this before we wrap it up for the uh, we wrap it up for the week? Okay. All right. So it's 515. So we're, it's 514, but basically 515. So we're, we're basically out of time. So um, thank you everyone again for coming today. I, I know everyone's really busy during this time. So you know, I really appreciate you guys coming um, to the lectures, right? Um, so member homework for is due tonight. Um, I will post the solutions to, to 2B when I get back to my office at 7 p.m. So, um, you know, I won't forget this time. And then homework five is posted as well. So make sure you take a look at that and start working on that as, as soon as you can, right? So have a great weekend, everybody. Um, oh, I, I will be out of town this weekend, and so um, if you try, if you email me this weekend, I probably won't get back to you until until Monday. And so I'm flying out somewhere on Friday, and so basically Friday through Sunday, I'm I'm going to be unavailable. So um, you can email me, of course, but then you know I probably won't respond until Monday. So have a great weekend, everybody. Um, you know, stay safe out there. You know, take care of yourself, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Professor. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Anne.